Hello, I'm Tom Rod, and we're starting our webinar, and I'm trying to see we have 28 participants on, and my internet is uh, dribbling in and out. I'm sorry to say that, but I hope you folks will bear with us because I think we're going to be able to get going here. Um, I'm a board member with the West Virginia Conservation Group, uh, Friends of Blackwater, and I'm coming to you via Zoom from my home in Preston County. We welcome to our Tucker County Railroad History uh, webinar with 30 participants. Uh, what people say is you got to wait for a couple of minutes to, for everybody to join. And so I'll tell you a little bit in way of introduction. We've been doing programs about regional history and heritage topics here in West Virginia for about 20 years. But I have to say we're still learning the ins and outs of the Zoom platform and obviously dependent on this technology. So. I hope you'll give us some understanding tonight if we fumble around a little bit. In just a few minutes, we're gonna start with our speaker, David Vago, and I hope everybody's ready to relax and have a good time this evening. I've got my banjo here, and I thought I'd uh, play a couple of notes just to uh, put us in the mood. If you're, thank you for uh, tolerating that. As I say, I'm Tom Rod, in case you just joined us. I'm a board member with the group Friends of Blackwater and I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. We have 33 participants online. And if all goes well, we'll have a recording of this program available in about a week and we'll send everybody who attended or registered a link. Uh, my next uh, duty is to introduce Cheyenne Carter, who recently joined the Friends of Blackwater staff. Cheyenne will be tonight's discussion leader and she'll be fielding your questions and comments in the Q&A section. Right now, she's going to tell us a little bit about tonight's speaker, David Vago. Cheyenne, welcome. Good evening, everyone. I'm Cheyenne Carter. I live in Thomas, West Virginia, and I'm Friends of Blackwater's executive assistant. Our webinar speaker tonight, David Vago, holds a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Maryland and a Master of Science in Industrial Archaeology from Michigan Tech. Dave grew up in Philadelphia and currently lives in Michigan. Dave was introduced to West Virginia by working at the Cass Scenic Railroad State Park and then helped to build the Beverly Heritage Center in Randolph County. His career in historic research and documentation, historical preservation and heritage advocacy now spans 20 years with projects all over the country. Dave's first project with Friends of Blackwater was the J.R. Clifford African American History Tour map of West Virginia. Tom, could you show us that map? It's quite beautiful. To date, Dave has completed three sets of historical signs in Tucker County to help local people and visitors learn all about the amazing railroad, coal, and timber industry of the Blackwater Canyon region. I just helped install a set of these cool signs in the town of Davis, and they are fabulous. There's a photograph of Emmy and I doing that. It's a lot of good, hard, fun work. We want to especially thank the West Virginia Humanities Council, which is making this program possible. We'll be sending out to registrants a Humanities Council evaluation form after the program. Please return it. That will help us do more of these programs. Now I'm going to turn our program over to David Vago, and he will be sharing his screen and slides with you as he talks. So you can type your questions and comments into the Q&A box at any time, and I will be reviewing them and then I will share them with David when his initial presentation is completed. So sit back and enjoy our program and thanks again for joining us. Take it away, Dave. Dave, you're still muted. 
There you go. Okay. Okay, can you hear me now? All good. All right, sounds good. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of the railroad and um, some of the related industries that, um, some of which still flourish, but, but at one time flourished in a big way in Tucker County. And we're gonna kind of, I'm gonna use kind of the railroad as the central uh, thread to, to piece the narrative together here. So um, let's get going. And uh, um, we're looking at a coal train on the Western Maryland and um, it's a string of coal cars which at one time was a ubiquitous and, and perhaps even iconic uh, site around the state of West Virginia, around the central Appalachian region, wherever bituminous coal could be found. And um, you know, bituminous coal was in no short supply in uh, Tucker County. And going back to the Civil War, the uh, West Virginia what became West Virginia during the Civil War in 1863 was by and large a patchwork of wilderness, relatively small towns along um, turnpike roads and subsistence farms in the valleys and occasionally on the, on the mountainsides and mountaintops as well. There were a few railroads but not many, primarily the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad which connected Baltimore with Parkersburg cut across the, the northern part of the state. Um, it came fairly close to Tarkin County by way of uh, places like Rouseburg, but um, it, it was one of the um, coveted transportation routes between the north and the south um, when the war began. And in fact, West Virginia exists in no small part because General George McClellan uh, knew that it could be an asset connecting the East and the West for the North and convinced Lincoln to let him uh, in, invade Western Virginia from Ohio in order to, to secure the railroad. And other parts of the state, because fighting took place all along the, the what are now the Eastern counties of West Virginia, a lot of people who from both armies who had, uh, the armies didn't just bring, you know, soldiers, infantry and, and, and cavalry, but it brought, uh, professionals of various kinds like surveyors and geologists, people who knew what they were looking at when they were walking through the mountains and found out crops with coal in them or, or, or knew what, what uh, value the, the timber on the mountains might have. And after the war ended, that kind of percolated for a while until people with deep pockets uh, began investing in really building railroads in earnest into the, the the various reaches of the state. Uh, one of those was um, Henry Gassaway Davis, who uh, was a financier of, of railroads and uh, related industries. And he built the West Virginia Central and Pittsburgh Railroad connecting um, Cumberland, Maryland with um, more or less Elkins and, and points to the South and West. Um, this is a view of the industrial complex that quickly grew up in Thomas in the late 19th centuries and in, 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 in the late 19th century and by the early 20th century it was a, it was a pretty big thing. Um, we'll talk more about that and it significantly transformed the landscape in what had previously been um, a relatively undeveloped valley. So here, this, this image uh, shows the Buxton and Lane Street store on the left and the West Virginia Central and Pittsburgh slash Davis Coal and Coke Company engineering, engineering building on the right. Both, uh, well, the engineering building is under construction. You can see the roof of the, ramp of the roundhouse down in the valley just past the store on the left and a pretty denuded hillside based on the appearance of the boxcars. This is the very end of the 19th century. We're talking about the 1880s when all this is, is 
under development. And uh, although the railroad and the coal company were under separate corporate names, they were, they were very much uh, Henry Gassaway Davis, Davis's deal. And uh, he, uh, as many such extractive industry operations did at the time, they operated on a fairly all-inclusive system of, of where, where not only was the work performed under the auspices of the company, but most people lived in houses and shopped at stores that belonged to the company as well. And the Bucks and the Lane Street store was no exception. Uh, this was one of our interpretive panels that we placed outside the store. And the stuff here on the left-hand side is company script of various kinds, which was basically company issued cur currency in which workers were paid. And that currency was good only at the company store. Not too long after the West Virginia Central and Pittsburgh got underway, another industrialist got involved. This is George Gould, and he's the son of Jay Gould, who was a major power broker in the railroad business in the late 19th century. And he was a, um, George Gould, the younger, inherited a number of properties that his father had either developed or grown after purchasing. And George Gould the Younger in the picture here was um, looked at the railroad scene on the East Coast and saw that there were a few major companies, the Pennsylvania Railroad, the New York Central, which was controlled by the Vanderbilt family, uh, kind of in the Baltimore and Ohio, kind of dominated traffic between the Eastern Seaboard and the West. And he wanted to introduce some more competition to the scene. And so using some of the ex existing properties that he inherited from his father, he conceived a plan to piece together a, a transcontinental railroad that would run from Baltimore to the, uh, to the Pacific coast at San Francisco Bay. And um, in order to get some mileage uh, on the Eastern seaboard, he bought a little railroad company called the Western Maryland, which belonged to the city of Baltimore at the time and, and had track heading west from that city and began expanding it west. He was heading for Pittsburgh, where he was going to connect it with some of his other, other uh, some other lines that eventually would connect end to end. Uh, in order to help provide capital for the expansion of the Western Maryland, he arranged for the Western Maryland to buy the West Virginia Central in Pittsburgh so that the hauling, of, so that the hold that the, the coal that that railroad hauled could generate some revenue that he could invest back into this expansion scheme. Now, uh, to make a long story short, things didn't work out as he had planned. He planned a very high-tech railroad with a whole lot of really expensive civil engineering work involved in it. It eventually got built, but he went bankrupt and lost control of it before that happened. And so instead of becoming part of a transcontinental system, what the Western Maryland became instead was a regional system whose primary business was hauling coal. And so, uh, in a sort of a, with a secondary function of forwarding freight through from, from other points that it connected with. And so, uh, on the left hand side of the map here, you can see Cumberland, Maryland, where the original West Virginia Central and Pittsburgh headed to the southwest, all the way down to Elkins. And just a little bit northeast of Elkins, you can see Kearns, Moore, Parsons, Hamilton, Hendrick. Hendricks, Douglas, Copeton, uh, and Thomas. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those communities here in a minute. Uh, so while the Western Maryland uh, had, while the West Virginia, while the former West Virginia Central in Pittsburgh was a new property for the Western Maryland, um, George Gould put some money into it and, and his successors put some money into it. Um, Thomas got a brand new brick passenger station where the previous one had been um, had been wooden and I apologize for the quality of this image I hadn't realized how blurry it was um, and Thomas continued to to grow and the technologies that made the industries happen there continue to evolve and, and become more sophisticated again we'll talk more about that in a minute so coal was mined for a few purposes one was to provide heat for homes and businesses. 
Um, but probably on a dollar for dollar basis, its biggest use was in the steel industry. Um, of course, it was also a fuel for, for industry in the days before um, electrified factories. But um, the way that coal it works in the steel making process is that it has to be converted to coke um, to become part of the not only fuel to heat up iron ore, but also uh, it serves in, in, in a, in a, as part of the chemistry in the steel making process as well in a blast furnace. And I won't go into all that, but basically making coke means burning off all the most of the volatiles so that you get nearly pure carbon. And that has to be done in a very slow and controlled way. And so at the mines in Thomas and in, in the whole industrial complex that surrounded Thomas and all the other little communities nearby, there were coke ovens. And these coke ovens were furnaces essentially where coal would be loaded in, burned, burned in a very slow and controlled way until there was nothing but coke left. And then the coke would be shipped to the steel mills. Eventually the steel mills started making this stuff on site, but um, for a few decades worth of Thomas's history, Coke ovens were a major feature of the landscape. And if you look at how big this bank of ovens is here along the right, uh, you can imagine the volume of, of uh, smoke and, and fume output that they had. So they really were kind of a you know, sensory character or defining feature of the landscape. And uh, the mines loaded out coal um, every day by the carload. The railroad would assign hopper cars to each mine or mine head every day. And uh, workers at the mine would take coal that was brought up from the ground, load it one car at a time into hopper cars, and one train after another would leave Thomas for the steel mills of Pittsburgh and Baltimore, or for um, export overseas from the port of Baltimore, or to distributors that send it off to industries and homes for fuel and heating. And other communities around Thomas also, also grew up quickly. Wooden frame houses and stores and other buildings were kind of the order of the day. They went up fast and they could be built pretty much to order. Usually they were built to a series of standard designs. And this is the village of Douglas, which is just ab above the, the head of the, of the falls in the Blackwater Canyon. Again, more on that shortly. Coal wasn't the only industry that, that made uh, the railroad money. Uh, in Davis, uh, a hardwood mill grew up that went through a series of owners, um, ended up being a property of the Babcock Boom and Lumber Company, which had a number of sawmills in, in different places around uh, West Virginia and the eastern United States. But um, a large hardwood sawmill in Davis cut timbers and boards for all kinds of different uses. In order to extract the logs, the lumber companies built their own logging railroads, which were uh, usually built for flexibility and ease of movement. So the track could be picked up and moved from one place to the next to keep up with the timber supply. And large and complicated steam powered machines, this is what's called a high lead aerial steam skitter, were used to bring logs on an aerial cableway over fairly rough terrain to a central loading site where they could be loaded onto the log trains, which hauled them to Davis. The logs were converted to lumber there and then hauled out on the Western Maryland. And this here shows the guy who's walking along here is walking not on a railroad track of the, of the, of the railroad company, but on a little um, tramway where, where finished lumber could be moved around on a loading dock on carts. And to his side is a gondola car loaded with heavy timbers that had been cut at the mill. Behind him is the passenger station in the downtown uh, section of Davis. And this is the Blackwater Canyon showing what this sort of industrial landscape looked like outside of town. On the right hand side, while in the center you can see the river. On the right hand side, uphill from the river, is the Western Maryland track heading down to, uh, to, to Hendricks and ultimately to Elkins. In kind of the background, if you look at the hillside to the left of the river, you'll see a, a 
a series of gouges in the in the land in the in the hillside in sort of a rough pinwheel pattern that's that's a pl place where one of those highly aerial steam skitter was set up and and as i mentioned the skitter used an aerial cableway that was powered by steam powered winches to drag logs over rough terrain to where they could be loaded onto trains and those logs moving along this cableway over and over again gouged out these these paths along the hillside and as, as they would log out one place they'd move that cable a little bit and a little bit and a little bit more around in, in a circle or a part of a circle around the skitter setup and that created this sort of pinwheel effect some of those are still visible today from uh, airplanes or from satellite photos now the railroad itself was was one of the most uh, machinery and labor intensive rail operations anywhere in the United States. That and I'll skip back that track through the canyon on the right hand side on the hillside uh, was a pretty steep grade. It approached three percent in places, which is the equivalent of three feet of rise for every hundred feet of, of, of horizontal track, and um, that's pretty steep for a railroad. Uh, if you imagine steel wheels on steel rails, uh, the factor of adhesion is not quite the same as, say, your rubber tires on your car on asphalt. And so uh, uh, steam engines and, and or locomotives of any kind, the factor of adhesion is just a little bit different. And in order to move these trains, uh, even the heaviest locomotives on the Western Maryland on this particular line, even if they were capable of hauling long trains in other places, they were only limited to so many cars, maybe 9, 10, 11, 12 cars moving up the canyon. And so a coal train coming through the canyon might have 9 or 10 locomotives on it. We're looking at the somewhere in the middle of a coal train here where we have three steam locomotives helping move a train up the hill where there may be two or three more on the front and two or three more pushing on the rear. Each one has its own crew and they would communicate with one another by way of whistle signals about when they were going to start, stop, and so forth. Those engine crews included an engineer who operated the locomotive and a fireman whose job it was uh, was to, to shovel coal and to watch the water level in the boiler. Uh, this photograph was taken by a very talented photographer who's been a volunteer at the Cass St. Grover for years named Walter Scriptunis, and uh, this is one of the crew members at Cass firing a locomotive there. And for just the, the, the uh, four mile trip it takes to get up to the picnic area at Cass and back, um, the firemen will shovel four tons of coal by hand. Uh, so it's hard work. And later engines had mechanical devices that assisted with that work, but uh, that didn't totally absolve the firemen of that job. So in creating the, the panels that we did for this uh, project, we talk a little bit about how, how the, uh, the use of locomotives on the railroad evolved. And so what we're looking at is the panel, one of two panels that we put up by the site of the former engine house in Thomas. And if you'll recall, we saw the roof of the early roundhouse in a previous panel or in a previous slide. Um, before I talk about that, I'll be, to provide some context for how that building evolved, I'll talk about locomotives very, very quickly. Over the course of a, say, 30-ish period, 30-ish year period, the engines on the Western Maryland evolved. And, and um, at the top left uh, is a locomotive. It's lettered for the Western Maryland, but it started out as a West Virginia and Central and Pittsburgh engine. It's what's called a consolidation type, and that refers to the arrangement of its wheels. Um, and you can see this a little more clearly in the, in the engine below. They're both the same wheel arrangement. If you look at the front, there's a little bitty wheel up at front. There's one on each side on each end of the axle. There's two wheels there. There's eight drive wheels, four on each side. There's no wheels supporting the rear. So this is a 280 consolidation type. Why that's significant is that it means that, that those four drive wheels, because there, are, there were no, the purpose of the wheels up front were to kind of guide the engine around curves. The, port, the purpose of the wheels in the rear, if there were any, would have been to support extra weight at the rear. But in order to get the maximum power out of an engine, you want as much weight as possible on those drive wheels. And so the 280 consolidation type 
accomplished that fairly well while still having those wheels up front to make it able to negotiate track somewhat smoothly. The one at top left was state of the art in the 1880s and 90s, uh, but engines grew quickly as we figured out how to make track that su could support the weight and as we figured out other technologies that enable bigger engines. In the World War I era, locomotives called articulated locomotives, which were basically two sets of drive wheels under one boiler that had a pivot in the middle so they could go around curves became popular on some railroads. Western Maryland bought a bunch and used them for a little while, but that extra kind of machinery brought with it some maintenance costs. And most likely for that reason, Western Maryland decided to return to simpler locomotives. But that doesn't mean that it didn't go bigger. And so at the bottom left is a locomotive of a, of a, of a model that the Western Maryland classified as an H9 type, which was one of the biggest consolidation type locomotives in the world. Um, there were bigger ones. There were bigger wheel arrangements and so on. But the H9, the, the 280 type came with the added benefit that it was relatively short and so good for curving mountainous trackage. All right, so all of that matters because um, they're using these short, heavy engines. They have to use a whole bunch of them at once to move these trains up the mountain. And um, if you picture a train arriving at the top of the hill uh, with nine engines on it, the next stretch of track to get them moving again on to Cumberland um, was comparatively level and didn't need all, all nine engines typically for a train. And so uh, they cut most of them off. But um, at the, at the, on the left-hand picture is, is a roundhouse, which is a storage and light, ma light maintenance facility for steam locomotives. And in order to save space, it was set up in a circle. That's where the name roundhouse comes from. And the turntable at the bottom right-hand side of that picture was this rotating device. It was used to position the engines into the different stalls of the roundhouse and to turn it around facing one way, you know, turn it around, face the other way. And uh, uh, since steam locomotives were usually built to operate forward in a single direction, turning seven or eight locomotives on that turntable would have taken a lot of time. And so instead, uh, a little ways down the track in uh, on the way to Douglas at the mouth of a little creek called Snyder Run, the railroad built what's called a Y, which is basically like a big three-point turn. If you picture turning your car around in someone's driveway, pulling in and then backing out the other way, it's basically what they were doing. Uh, I'll have another slide in a minute showing how that setup looked. But because they built this Y where they could take entire groups of engines and just turn them all at once, making this three-point turn rather than going one at a time on the turntable. They got rid of the turntable. And on the, in the map on right, you can see where they, where they did that. Um, and this photograph basically shows the same thing. Eventually, it became clear that they didn't, because they weren't, there was no turntable, there was no point in having a roundhouse. And in order to have a more modern maintenance facility, the roundhouse was replaced with this corrugated metal building that you see behind the two locomotives in this photograph. And, um, it was sort of uh, engine houses of this type were operated on kind of the same principle as like a drive through oil change place. Engines could pull in at one end and be received different kinds of maintenance and service from in the building and then pull out the other uh, without obstructing one another. All right, and this is the why. Um, if you look at the map in the, in the background image, you can kind of see what I meant uh, where it's a three point turn, uh, the track forms a triangle, engines pull in one way, back down the second leg, and pull back forward on the third leg. Now, Thomas was the base of operations for the, the engines that helped the coal trains get up the hill, but it was also the base of operations for several different branch lines that went off in different directions to collect coal and timber. And um, if we look at our map here, at the top here is Thomas. Um, we're going downhill toward Elkins, 
uh, we encounter Copeton just before Copeton. You can see the the you can see Snyder Run where the Y is and where a branch line also went off to another set of mines. Um, Douglas is at the mouth of the canyon. There's another branch. There's another railroad going off here. But coming off of you can see this other track that's with the words Western Maryland strung out along the uh, the line here. Um, I think I have this blown up here. Yeah, there we go. Um, that came out of, even though it appears to come off the railroad at Douglas, because of the topography in order to get over the mountain, it had to kind of run along the hillside next to the river. So it actually branched off from the main line in Thomas. But its function was to get the railroad over to Davis, where the sawmill was located. And um, this was our panel that we put up by the Thomas Railroad Station. The reason I show it here is so that we can zoom in on the aerial photo of the railroad yard uh, by the mine between the passenger station and the mine complex. And if you look just beyond the church steeple, you'll see a bridge that connected the passenger station to the town of Thomas. Underneath that bridge is that branch line heading off toward Davis. And just off to the right in the picture is the is the Buxton Land Street Company store. All right. So this railroad built an industrial complex, or or, or the, the the railroad permitted the construction of this industrial complex in Thomas, which by the World War II period was fairly large and advanced. Um, in earlier pictures that we saw, there were rows of iron smokestacks. Those were, were replaced by these large concrete smokestacks. Those smokestacks vented smoke from the engines that powered the mine complex, coal-fired engines. Now we can see that a little bit more closely here. So the picture we looked at just before with the steeple in the foreground, that yard is over here by the letter E on the left-hand side, and where our photographer was somewhere off a few inches to the left. Um, we see the mine complex right here in the center. By the letter D is the main head frame where um, the, the mine came out of the ground. Beyond the smokestack to the right, by the letter B is downtown Thomas and um, the neighborhood behind it off to the, off to the right. Uh, here we're looking at Douglas uh, and the panoramic image. I'll kind of skip back and forth here for a second. The panoramic image was uh, shows us kind of how the whole town was laid out, and uh, it's probably on the size of most of your screens. It's not readily apparent, but you can see by the letter C here. There's a a mine a mine complex here. There's another mine complex over here on the right. Another couple, in fact. Um, this whole area was just covered with mines and mine entrances underground. A great many of all the mine tunnels where there were literally, literally hundreds of miles of tunnels, were all interconnected. Um, but all of this supported a community that grew very, very quickly. And so this panel speaks to some of that. We had a schoolhouse, we had a company store, a barbershop, all kinds of things. Um, and uh, for most of the people that lived in these communities, if they didn't work in the railroad, more likely than not, they worked in the mine. And in fact, the mine was the mines were the primary employers. So I put this passage that we picked up from one of the people that we interviewed in the course of putting these exhibits together. The coal miners would walk across a bridge from Douglas to the coal mines on the other sides of the North Fork of the Blackwater River to go to work. The miners would go get a drink at the company store before going home. There was also a shower house in Douglas so that they could clean up after work. Each employee was assigned a number and a round metal tag with their number. When they had a car, when they had loaded a car with coal, they would put their tag on the car to make sure they got credit for it. There were six subsurface mines in the Douglas area and one mine boss living in town was in charge of all six. When the Coke ovens were running, it lit up the valley. And that was something that people who remember Coke ovens always said, is that they ran 24 hours a day in these furnaces. Each one burned brightly. Uh, all right, between Douglas and Thomas was Copeton, and uh, there was another industrial complex here, another mine complex here. We'll, we'll zoom in on that. 
same kind of pattern, the core of industrial facilities surrounded by houses, company stores, machine shops, uh, churches, schoolhouses, everything that was needed to create a community um, and attract a workforce to a place that prior to all of this had a very small population. All right, so this is one of our panels that we used to, to talk about what happened in Davis. Davis built up not, not so much around the mining industry, but around the timber industry. At the core of it was the Babcock sawmill, but um, uh, and we're looking at on this map here, let me see, we blew that up. I don't know if we've got that bigger here. At the core of that was the Blackwater Boom and Com Lumber Company's hardwood sawmill, but we also had a tannery over here on the left, which used um, chemicals that could be extracted from tree bark to tan leather. On the far right-hand side, um, we have a, um, a pulp mill of the West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company, which also built the operation Cass, eventually became West Vaco Paper and then the Mead West Vaco Corporation. If anybody's familiar with paper mills either in Covington, Virginia or Luke, Maryland, both of those paper mills were supplied with timber from either uh, Tucker County or Pocahontas County. And, um, this mill on the right-hand side was where softwood logs were processed in the first steps of, of preparing them to be made into paper. All right. So, took a workforce to make all this happen, and um, there were locals to be hired even at the beginning, but there weren't enough of them. And that meant attracting workers from the deep south, from overseas, from wherever large labor pools who could work for relatively little money could be had. And so Italian families and families from Eastern Europe and African-American families from the deep south all came and uh, many of them went to work in the mines. Some of them established businesses that helped make the community more robust. Um, and um, each of these little towns had its own neighborhoods that were divided up by language or by ethnicity. The work tended to be hard, tended to be dangerous. Um, this is a, a plaque by the, by the Thomas Davis Lions Club memorializing um, uh, local, the victims of local mine disasters. And if we look at an underground mine, this is at the place where uh, coal from different mine tunnels came to a central gathering point before it started to head uphill and out of the mine. And what you're actually looking down, what looks like kind of a through fare there, is a conveyor belt. Um, the conveyor belt is on the right there. You can kind of see the chunks of coal. I guess I can use my arrow to emphasize that. There's that. And um, so in, in, in mines of earlier technology, the coal was moved through mines on carts, on, on little, uh, little little buggies that ran along uh, narrow gauge railroad tracks. Those conveyor belts brought the coal to the surface where in a building called a tipple, uh, workers would sort the coal uh, with the assistance of machinery. Workers would pick impurities like slate from the coal and then uh, the coal would pass through a series of screens that, that divided the chunks up by size. Different sizes of coal were used for different purposes. Uh, this is a picture of a United Mine Workers group, United Mine Workers of America on strike during a late 19th century strike that got quite heated at one point. Uh, at one point a train load of miners derailed in the canyon and uh, there were accusations of sabotage that followed. The Okay, I'm, I'm skipping around here, but um, in putting this whole interpretive story together, of course, we did our standard research, reading books and, and looking through archives for source material and that kind of thing, but we also talked to people. And so um, we talked to uh, the gentleman in the, the right-hand picture here, whose name is uh, Stuart Thayer, the one remaining piece of the Davis or the Thomas, I'm sorry, the Thomas Mining Industrial Complex is a brick building that was once the mine machine shop. It's painted yellow now. And just before you turn off uh, to go down to the Buckleton and Lane Street store, store 
down the hill in the valley there. Um, that's part of a recycling complex that Mr. Thayer founded, but he grew up in, uh, in Thomas. Uh, the picture associated with him here is his grandparents. Grandfather came from Eastern Europe and worked in the mines. And um, his was a story like many. We, um, he, he, he provided us some, some good details about what it was like to live in uh, the days when the mines were, were you know, going strong and were the primary employer in town. Uh, we talked to some folks in, um, uh, in Douglas. Uh, we've got uh, Guy Bassalone and Tony Lambrunic here sitting on the railing outside the company store in Douglas. You can see the railroad just downhill from it behind. Company store was located next to the tracks so that it could receive merchandise. Um, but the company store, because it was it was you know, it was a department store, it sold everything you needed that made it a social gathering point in town. So it would not have been unusual usual on any given day to find people hanging out on the front steps like that. Uh, same gentleman here with a few of their compatriots. And um, Another person who helped us on the project, Joe Dumeyer. Uh, I, if Joe's watching, I'm going to have to apologize. I forget what familial relations, relation he is to you, but uh, he was a he was a an office employee for the Western Maryland, worked in the uh, uh, in the engineering building uh, just next to the uh, uh, the company store, the Rocks and Lane Street store. All right, so um, by the 1950s, the, the, the mines were, were, were in decline. The, there was uh, a number of things at play that, that, that all came together in the West Virginia coal industry in general and in Tucker County in particular. Some of, some of employment was on decline because um, technological development, mechanization of mines meant that in order to mine coal at any given mine, it took fewer people. Uh, some mines were just tapped out. They were they were exhausted because decades of mining had taken place there. Um, demand for coal was shifting through you know, shifting through changes in how people use their homes, their industrial use, all kinds of things. And so, um, uh, by the 1970s, uh, the railroad was was still moving coal, but nowhere near in the volumes that it did and, and largely no longer from the immediate Thomas area. Most coal trains that passed through Thomas were originating further to the west and south. Um, the railroad kept a base of operations in town, but um, that was on the decline and, and um, finally ended in 1985. We're looking at the highway that crossed the river right, right, at, um, right at Thomas. Okay. Following the end of the major period of coal mining and the shutdown of the railroad, there's left a landscape um, that uh, coal, coal contains a high volume of sulfur. And when water percolates through coal or through coal smoke or through the debris of coal mining, it picks up that sulfur. And, and, and so you, have, you end up with water that has a high volume of sulfuric acid in it. Not to mention that you have a landscape that is stripped and denuded. And so Friends of Blackwater undertook during the 1990s to try and reclaim some of the land. And what we're looking at is the same valley that we saw. Some of you might recall a few slides back. I probably pulled it up if I put it in here. Let's see how quickly we can zoom back through. I'm gonna go all the way back to there, to Anyway, let me let me just not do that. Um, point is the the valley between Davis and Thomas. There we go. That one right there, which was once uh, full of this industrial development and homes and, and so on and so forth. Um, populations had left. The industry and economy had left, and so reclamation of the landscape. This is what happened. This is the result of that reclamation where 
where the earth was essentially resodded and uh, and covered over in order to not eliminate the, the the waste, but to at the very least encapsulate it and limit the amount of runoff on the surface going into the river. Um, let a lot of mine entrances closed off as well. But essentially, that's kind of how the history of the industry in this place wraps up. And I'm happy to entertain questions here. I'm going to end screen sharing so that I can actually see what you guys are typing in the Q&A. Thank you so much, David, for your very compound and interesting history lesson this evening. We have a question coming in from Kathleen, and she's asking, what ethnic or racial group actually built the tracks in Tucker County? Built the railroad? Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember if we encountered research that broke, that broke that out that specifically. Um, some of the local folks who are watching might actually know the answer to that. I do not. Um, by the 1880s, typically a railroad crew would have been uh, mixed, uh, or at least the, the, the larger workforce would have been mixed, um, oftentimes because uh, immigrants would have been brought in fresh, fresh off the boat, basically. Um, great many great many numbers of them didn't speak English and for that and other reasons they often were assigned to work together in groups by either ethnic group or by language so that a, a single translator could could work with them and, and uh, uh, of course there was a division of labor aspect to that too but um, the ethnic groups that were in this area during the early period included local people who were largely of either Scots, Irish, or German descent. Um, they were soon joined by Eastern European immigrants. And then as a later wave of Italian immigrants came in, uh, they were present as well. But likely from the start or nearly the start, there were also groups of African-American laborers who, who, some of whom were brought here to live and to work for the longer term. And some of whom were brought here in, in groups by contractors and that kind of thing. That's kind of the general trend. And, uh, uh, Great. Thank you. We have another question rolling in from Dave. Given the process of getting coal from underground to car to surface, how did the underground worker get credit with his tag? That's a good question. The underground worker got credit for his tag by the ton. Um, and um, that was an easy thing to accomplish with the um, with the individual mine cars, the you know, which were usually the size of, say, a small van. Maybe that's a little bit too big, but uh, uh, say a couple of refrigerators turned on their side. Um, just trying to think of something comparable off the top of my head, but um, uh, those could be pushed over a scale and weighed. And um, a scrupulous company would account for, would, would for one thing calibrate the scales on a regular basis, account for the weight of the car and so on and so forth, and account for uh, whatever impurities were in the coal relatively accurately. Uh, but um, in practice, it was sort of a your mileage may vary kind of thing. Uh, I'm not sure how that process changed once they began using conveyor belts. Perhaps, the, and again, somebody local might know the answer to this too, but um, I would guess that either there was a way by that point to weigh coal at the point where it was loaded onto the conveyor belt, or um, perhaps an hourly wage system was in place by then. Another question from Dave. What was the peak population of the area of Thomas and Davis? I should have anticipated that someone would ask that and I do not know the answer. We've been working closely with Joe Dunmire, the man that you had referred to in the um, slides previously who had, a family, previously who had a family member. And, and he's, he's a great, a great resource, resource to reach out to. Um, I don't have any other questions to, but I have a question for you. 
Okay. I'm wondering what um, what got you into historical interpretation and what are some of the most rewarding parts of this job for you? Well, uh, let me let me first um, because this question about population is nagging me. I want to I want to say that that it was something that we had covered at one time, and if memory serves, I'll say that it was a few thousand, just to kind of give you a sense of of scale. Um, to compare, um, uh, some of the smaller communities were a few hundred Douglas, um, Cokedon, that kind of thing, a few hundred people, even at their peak. In Thomas, it would have been under 10,000, but but um, in the four digits by a significant amount. Okay, so what got me into this? I started out, well, there's a whole bunch of different things that all kind of conspired to make that happen. I grew up in a neighborhood of old houses, and I grew up in a family where we, you know, we didn't replace things frequently or quickly, so I grew up with kind of an appreciation for old things, things with a history, I had grandparents who told me stories about growing up where they grew up in, in the time that they grew up. Uh, and to give you a sense of that timeline, my oldest grandparent was my father's father, who was born in the year 1898. So um, I, I was later in life when I realized how significant that was, grateful to realize what a connection to um, to the past I had. And, and um, looks like someone shared uh, population information here. So oh, great. in 1910, uh, he says there's 12 more rows there, but in 1910, we had a population of just over 2,300 people. Um, yeah, so I grew up with kind of connections to the past, and um, I came from a long line of engineers, mechanical engineers, and I was more artistic than most of them were, so I thought architecture would be a good compromise, and I hated it. But there was this historic preservation program at school. I studied, uh, I basically was a graduate program, but I kind of talked my way into some of the classes and really liked that. And so ended up um, having my first job out of college, working at a railroad museum down in Savannah, Georgia, where I did, I was hired originally to do restoration work on railroad rolling stock and buildings. But when they realized I had some humanities background as well, some writing ability and some design ability, they had me start creating interpretive panels. And that was kind of the beginning of a long slide into this adventure here. So that's what I've been doing ever since. What a journey. Well, we have a few more minutes left. Anyone else has any further questions? more people have provided comments. Barbara Quattro says, my father was born in Cokedon in 1918. When he was young, he and other boys in Cokedon would hop a freight car in Cokedon and go all the way to Cumberland. They would get a whipping when they came back home, but that didn't stop them. <laughs> One of the men she in the mining that. picture you showed earlier was my great uncle, Poker Joe Quattro, Barbara said. Amazing. Um, and, and it's interesting that she mentions that because one of the people that we talked to, um, and I mentioned that, that growing up uh, in, in Douglas, the company store in Douglas was smaller than the one in, um, in the, the, the Bucks and Elm Street store. Um, and the, the bigger store, needless to say, had a bigger and better selection of merchandise. And so they would go to to the B and L store to shop. Oftentimes, even though they had a closer one, and um, sometimes that meant walking. Sometimes it meant hitching a ride, or or, or for for those who had a car driving. Um, sometimes for young people, it meant hopping a train to Douglas and back, or taking adventures wherever else they might decide to go. So it sounds like Ms. Quattro's. Uh, father uh, may have been one of several people who engaged in that activity. Okay, Susan Cook asks how we did our research. Um, we used a number of sources. Um, it was a, 
stack of six or eight maybe history books either on the railroad or on Tucker County that, that we pulled some of our research from. I have, uh, after I, I, I talked about my, my background up to a point, but after, after I did my work in Savannah and started getting into exhibits, I ended up getting a master's degree in industrial heritage from Michigan Tech. And so um, spent a few years doing fairly intensive research on industrial history basically learning how all this old technology works and how it all fit together. Um, since then, uh, have worked in other capacities that have added to that. So kind of had a working background knowledge where I could just sort of talk about and explain technology. Uh, but we also talked to, like, as I mentioned, a handful of people that remembered some of this stuff firsthand. So it was a combination of and then we also got some original source materials from from a few sources like the West Virginia Department of Cultural and History. So it was a combination of other people's research in the form of books, firsthand recollections from people we talked to, original archival stuff, and just kind of my own background knowledge. Carol asks, can you tell us about the schools at that time? I can do that. And there, there, there were several different, schools took several different forms in these different communities. Again, kind of like the company store, it was based on the size of the community. So in the smallest towns, schools were usually built, maintained by the coal company, the, the, the primary property owner in town. Um, and in, in a small community, there might be only a, a couple of rooms where several different grades would, would be in the same classroom at one time and all kind of receiving instruction at their own different level. In the larger communities, the grade schools were more kind of what we expect typically from, you know, a separate classroom for each grade or whatever. Um, they were almost all, perhaps entirely all wooden buildings, wood frame buildings. Um, in Thomas, there was a school on the property that's that's kind of just I can't quite say across the street because the street kind of makes a weird turn there, but uh, just to in, sort of in front, if you're standing in front of the BNL, to the right there was uh, an African American school. Schools were segregated in that community at one point. For much of the time that we're talking about here, um, but yeah, that's kind of the basic form that they took. Dave has another question. What was the number of different languages in the newspapers that were printed? It was considerable. And again, that's a number I don't recall off the top of my head. There was a, to give an idea of how much adaptability there had to be and how much intersection there was, uh, uh, Stuart Thayer told us, I think he said that there was a, a company employee I think he said worked in the payroll department, which would make sense given the number of people he had to interact with in that capacity, who I think he said knew 11 different languages, at least fluently enough to be able to communicate about payroll and that kind of thing. It's um, quite incredible. Krista says, Dave, wonderful presentation. I grew up just up the street from the Buxton and Land Street building. I especially love the color drawing early on on in the presentation. I'm fairly sure my childhood home is one of those illustrations. No, that's cool. Yeah, the old uh, hand colorized, hand tinted postcards are some of my favorite images. They don't always provide a lot of detail if you're trying to do research, but they're, they're one of my favorite kind of images to look at. Frank wants to know about the interaction between Davis Lumber Community and Thomas Minor Community. Um, most likely that took place in at least a couple forms. Of course, there was um, the railroad tied them together. Um, there was probably likely some crossover in ownership of stock between some of the, excuse me, some of the companies at, at higher levels. Um, the, um, so there, there was this sort of formal business and, and relationship in this relationship by way of the link of the railroad. And of course, railroad employees knew people 
all up and down the line. They all knew each other, um, even if they were based out of Thomas or based out of Elkins or, or based out of a particular place. Um, people in all these different communities knew each other by way of, of their workplace because their workplace was strung out over miles and miles. Um, in terms of informal community interaction, uh, that's a little bit harder to gauge and to measure as I said, we know from what some of the people who grew up there told us that they went from coal community to coal community because, you know, there were different amenities that they could partake in. My guess would be that there was some of that between Davis and Thomas, too, if for no other reason than because Thomas was kind of a thriving little place. It was kind of a little bitty cosmopolitan center that had theater and some, and which Davis did. Davis had some of that, too. But, but Thomas was kind of a center of cultural activity. And so there was likely, you know, people going back and forth between the two for, for that kind of thing. I want to be mindful of time, but Tom would like to know if your research is available somewhere. Um, I have not written my research in any kind of formal or published way. So uh, the closest thing to that is the panels that are on posts in the ground along the railroad grade. But um, there's probably some way that I could organize something if, if people were interested in seeing more. Um, if nothing else, I could at least provide a bibliography. Dave, do you have a few more minutes to answer just a couple more questions? I left the evening open, so. All right. If anyone else is bored to tears, they're welcome to stay. Grace asks, were the local breweries for the coal miners? Local breweries. That's something that I, I hadn't heard specific reference to. But um, there were local breweries everywhere in the height of the American industrial age. Um, and drinking was, for better or for worse, a primary form of entertainment. And um, in the same way that somebody was going to show up and start, you know, a laundry business, or somebody was going to show up and start a theater, or somebody was going to show up and start, um, you know, selling housewares or whatever, somebody was going to show up in your community and start making beer. Um, we we know that miners and factory workers everywhere stop stopped in for a beer somewhere on the way home. And so um, although I haven't heard specific references to local breweries, I wouldn't be surprised if, um, if there was one at the very least in Davis or Thomas. And, and if not, somewhere not too far away. Cumberland had its own local brewery for years. And, um, it, it sounded like they sold beer at the company store. Yeah. that that. That was true, and I, I don't know where it was sourced, but um, yeah, there would have been plenty of beer to be found, regardless of where it was made. Ozzy has a question. Is there an effort to add some of the interpretive panels slash rail trail towards the north, i.e. in the direction of Cumberland? The man who's hired to, to make the panels, I don't necessarily have a, a handle on what the long-term vision is, that would be a question for the Friends of Blackwater folks. Um, but every time we finish a project, Judy Rod, who's been kind of my main contact point on this, starts telling me about the next thing she's got in mind. So um, I wouldn't be surprised. Neither would I. Denise asked, did they use script? Yes, they did. That was, uh, um, it was more, it was, it was, it would have been if you walked if you traveled from one community to the next in West Virginia between the 1880s and the 1920s, uh, it would have been more surprising not to find a company or a town that used script than one that, that did. Uh, it was pretty commonplace. It was almost a, a standard way of doing things. Um, and not just in coal. coal. Coal, the coal industry was the most commonplace where it was done, but most of the lumber camps did too. It looks like this may be our last question of the evening. Okay. Dave asks, 
How much, if any, timbering took place down in Canaan Valley? A ton. And in fact, that was the Canaan Valley was one of the primary sources of timber that fed the mill, the Babcock Mill in Davis. I suppose that wraps up our evening for this evening. Thank you everyone for joining us and a big thank you to you, David. Thank you. Everyone. Don't don't forget to return your ev evaluation email we've sent out to you. Keep an eye out for future webinars that Friends of Blackwater will be holding. I'm hoping that we get to have another one with you, David. This is great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night.